After watching this video, you should be able to describe the pentose phosphate shunt, also known as the hexose monophosphate shunt. Be able to list some general locations of where you find this reaction, some functions, particularly the production of NADPH and nucleic acids, and describe some of the regulation in the liver, particularly in response to fasting and the well-fed state. So let's take a look like we always do at the big picture, and we can see here pentose phosphate shunt is in the grouping with glycolysis, glycogenesis, fatty acid synthesis, and triglyceride synthesis in the liver. And when all of these guys are turned on in the well-fed state, when there's lots of insulin around, the uh, other reactions in the liver, gluconeogenesis, glycogen breakdown, fatty acid oxidation, and ketogenesis, they're all going to be turned off. And the opposite's true in the fasting state, when you, you want to be making glucose, breaking glycogen down, oxidizing fatty acids, and making ketones, you want glycolysis off, you want glycogen synthesis off, you shouldn't be making fatty acids or triglycerides, and the pentose phosphate shunt will be off too. And we can get a better sense of why that would be if we go and look at um, a familiar picture. Uh, this again is in the liver. And we can see that the pentose phosphate shunt on the right side, you see glucose 6-phosphate here is kind of coming off and then you have it, um, it the, the intermediates re-entering the glycolytic pathway and I'm just showing here because this is the most important part um, with respect to metabolic biochemistry um, that NADPH is going to be produced and that NADPH is very important as like we mentioned earlier in reductive biosynthetic reactions such as fatty acid synthesis and cholesterol synthesis. So when we're in the well-fed state and we want to be doing that, we want to be making fatty acids, we want to be making cholesterol, we need NADPH around to help that happen and that's why we want the pentose phosphate shunt turned on. Okay, We can see that there really isn't an opposite reaction to pentose phosphate shunt. So in the fasting state we see that it's just not happening. But I think we can appreciate that if we are doing gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis and we're making G6-phosphate, remember we want that to be going to glucose and going out of the liver. We wouldn't want any of this glucose, this precious glucose 6-phosphate, we wouldn't want any of that to go into the pentose phosphate shunt and potentially steal some of it away because that's, that, that's going to be providing the glucose source that's ultimately going to go out into the plasma and circulate around and go to places like your brain and, and, and um, in, non-insulin dependent tissues. Okay, so this is the big picture, and we're going to be focusing on pentose phosphate shunt right here. Okay, now if we go and look at the reaction of the pentose phosphate shunt, it's actually quite complicated, and this is um, an oversimplification of it. Now, what I'm showing here is not specifically the liver. Okay, so that's why I didn't write liver on here, and I didn't put any glucose transporters. Presumably, um, cells that can take up glucose, which is virtually every cell in the body, uh, takes up glucose, you know, either uses glucokinase if it's like places like the liver or hexokinase, um, which is found everywhere, and you phosphorylate glucose and make your G6-phosphate, okay? Now, um, what happens to this glucose 6-phosphate, instead of going into other pathways like it could, like we've discussed, like glycogen or glycolysis, we're going to show that this glucose 6-phosphate can go in another pathway. And this enzyme here is the critical enzyme of the pentose phosphate shunt, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So this is an oxidative reduction reaction, and we can see that we're going to be using an NADP+, and it's going to be, um, it's going to be reduced here to form NADPH. And there's an intermediate that's made. It's not terribly important. I didn't even list it here. It's 6 phospholactone and that gets, um, that gets hydrolyzed, actually. And ultimately, we make the 6-phosphogluconate, okay? And the 6-phosphogluconate um, undergoes another oxidative reduction reaction where we make another NADPH. We also peel off a CO2, and the only reason why I'm showing you that is um, this is where the pentose phosphate shunt gets its name, right? Because now we have a pentose, okay, ribulose 5-phosphate, which can uh, ultimately become ribose 5-phosphate and be, um, be um, involved in nucleic acid biosynthesis, or it could undergo a series of reactions and ultimately make intermediates that can go back into glycolysis, like fructose 6-phosphate 
or glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, old friends from glycolysis. Um, these reactions here are the non-oxidative reactions. They're all reversible. There's a bunch of different steps that happen. And I'm just summarizing this by writing the names are transketolases and transaldolases that are involved. Okay, so if you come across these enzyme names, these are part of the non-oxidative reversible reactions of the pentose phosphate shunt. Okay, now glucose 6-phosphate dehydrase again is the most important. It's the rate limiting and it's what's going to set off this this pathway and allow you to go in these different directions. Now what I've also shown on here is the NADPH that you make. We've already mentioned that it's involved in reductive biosynthesis like uh, fatty acid and cholesterol synthesis which is really um, very important in the liver. Also very important clinically is the reduction of uh, hydrogen peroxide. Um, and NADPH is involved, um, you need it uh, to reduce glutathione. There's a glutathione reductase enzyme that requires NADPH to keep glutathione in the reduced state so it can then um, take care of the hydrogen peroxide and prevent oxidative damage. Okay, and there's a glutathione peroxidase enzyme that, 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 that's involved there. Now, um, the reason why this is terribly important clinically is that when, you're, when you have mutations in glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, the red blood cell is especially vulnerable because it um, uses the NADPH not to make stuff. You know, the, the red blood cell doesn't make fatty acids or cholesterol or anything like that. It's primarily solely using the NADPH to take care of oxidative damage. And when, when uh, red blood cells are deficient in G6PD, they're very vulnerable to oxidative damage, especially if they take certain drugs or certain foods like fava beans, and you get something called drug-induced hemolytic anemia. And since this is a focus on metabolic biochemistry, we're not going to really go into that. Okay, But when we talk about hemolytic anemias and hematology, um, the biochemistry of, um, of how G G6PD is important there, we'll, we'll discuss it at that, at that time. But um, with respect to the, to the biochemistry uh, in, in the liver especially, the NADPH is important for those biosynthetic reactions. Now, there's some other things that NADPH does as well that um, I'm not even going to list here. It's involved, it's involved in white blood cells and, and, and some of their function and phagocytosis, uh, nitric oxide synthesis and some other things like that. Um, even in the liver, the, the P450 cytochrome system uh, also uses NADPH. Um, we're going to focus um, our discussion on this reductive biosynthesis, right? So if we go back to our diagram here, um, this NADPH in the liver is especially important in these processes over here, and that's why um, pentose phosphate shunt, when it's turned on, is turned on when all of these reactions are turned on. Okay, so it's an easy way to remember it. All right, now if we go back to our, our first slide, um, the location of the pentose phosphate shunt, it's really all over the place. The liver certainly has uh, G6PD. We said that the red blood cell certainly has it, even though it, it doesn't really use it to make nucleic acids or, um, or to make um, cholesterol or, or fatty acids. It's very important in handling oxidative stress. The white blood cells use it for phagocytosis. And, you know, um, it, it's a pretty ubiquitous enzyme, all right? Now, the function, again, the NADPH is critical for us for the metabolic biochemistry and, um, and some of the other clinically relevant effects of NADPH. And the nucleic acid synthesis, you, you desperately need the, NAD, the, uh, the glucose 6-phosphate um, dehydrogenase and the pentose phosphate shunt to make the ribose 5-phosphates. And in fact, if you have an overactivity of the pentose phosphate shunt, and there are certain disorders where that occurs, you actually get an overabundance of nucleic acids, and you end up with um, um, a problem with... Um, with uh, uric acid production and gout, and we'll discuss that um, in another lecture. Now, the regulation, the final piece here, is pretty simple, okay? And it goes back to um, insulin glucagon, all right? And it turns out that the regulation here is going to be insulin induction. of G6PD. Okay? Now, does that look familiar? Does that look familiar? This mechanism. It should, because if you go back uh, 
to, um, if you go back to glycolysis, if you remember, this is, this is the picture in the liver, remember the three regulated steps in glycolysis, uh, the one that was regulated by insulin induction was glucokinase, right? So when you have lots of insulin around, glucokinase is induced and that helps turn on glycolysis. You get lots of G6P, which actually will go off into the, into the pentosphosphate shunt too because insulin induces the G6PD enzyme. So um, this, this is very similar to what we discussed with insulin inducing glucokinase, the same kind of idea. And so what that means is that when we're in the fasting state, all right, and we have low insulin, right, we have a, um, a decrease in G6PD and a decrease in the pentose phosphate shunt. When we have the well-fed state, remember we have lots of glucose around, glucose-mediated insulin secretion, we have lots of insulin. We have an induction of G6PD and a turning on of the pentose phosphate shunt. So it's a pretty straightforward regulation. Now so um, we go back and we think about um, this diagram again, we have lots of insulin around the well-fed state, insulin binds insulin receptors on the liver, right? It induces glucokinase, it helps facilitate glucose uptake because we're keep keeping a, a low glucose concentration, and as glucose 6-phosphate goes down the glycolytic pathway and that pathway is turned on, we're also turning on this pathway for glycogen as well as the pentose phosphate shunt. So we're going full force with all these reactions to help store glycogen, uh, make fatty acids, cholesterol, and, um, and that all is going to be helpful for when we're in the fasting state. So now that we've discussed the location, which is pretty ubiquitous, the functions of the pentose phosphate shunt, and this regulation, you should have a pretty good idea about um, the pentose phosphate shunt or hexomonophosphate shunt. And that concludes this lecture on this pathway.